Welcome to the second half of our session on nutrient removal processes in wastewater. Uh, in the first segment, we covered uh, BOD removal and nitrification and denitrification, which are the nitrification or nitrogen removal processes. In this session, we're going to talk about phosphorus removal. Phosphorus removal can be summed up in, in this diagram. Phosphorus that comes into the treatment plant is about two-thirds soluble or dissolved and about a third in particulate form contained in organic molecules. The whole idea of phosphorus remo removal is to convert this scenario to one where almost all the phosphorus is particulate so that it can be settled or filtered out of the water. And we can do this two ways. We can do it chemically and we can do it biologically. Um, let's talk about chemical phosphorus removal first. The goal is to precipitate the phosphorus, the dissolved phosphorus, by adding a metal ion to the wastewater. And uh, what happens basically in terms of a chemical reaction is that we have the metal ions plus the phosphate that's dissolved in the water combines to form a metal phosphate that is insoluble and will precipitate as a fine solid and there's an acid that comes out as a byproduct. Not enough to make the water very acidic, but it's something that we, we calculate and think about when we design these systems. Um, unfortunately, we also get a side reaction, and that is the metal ions that we add uh, with, a, with a chemical uh, also react with bicarbonate or hardness in the water to form a metal hydroxide. Um, now, this is not a problem from a process standpoint. It's a problem from adding the chemical because you need more chemical because some of it is used up by reacting with the hardness in the water. These are some of the chemicals that can be used. We can use calcium in the form of lime. We can use aluminum in the form of alum, sodium aluminate, or aluminum chlorhydrate. We can use iron in the form of ferric chloride or ferric sulfate. And we can use uh, iron in the form of ferrous sulfate. Um, most plants use alum as the least expensive. Some use ferric chloride. Uh, which they often use in other parts of the treatment plant. Um, they all have advantages and disadvantages in, in uh, different applications. They all have different costs, and each plant kind of has to do their own evaluation of what's the most cost effective for them to use to remove the phosphorus. Uh, for those who are chemists and like this stuff, these are the, uh, the metal phosphates that are formed when you add those ions to the water, and those, all those compounds uh, do not dissolve in water and will precipitate out of solid particles. This is the, the most important thing that I want you to understand about chemical phosphorus removal. This graph shows the, uh, the amount of chemical that has to be added to achieve a certain level of phosphorus uh, remaining in the water. On the vertical axis is a measurement of the amount of aluminum compared to the amount of phosphorus that's in the wastewater. So if we had 8 milligrams per liter of phosphorus in our wastewater, if we added 8 milligrams per liter of aluminum, now this is in moles to make it equal in a chemical terms, that would be 1 to 1. Well, if you add 1 mole of aluminum ions to 1 mole of phosphorus, if you look at the graph, you can see that you can get down to about one milligram per liter of phosphorus. If you need to remove more phosphorus than that, let's say you need to get down to 0 0.05 uh, residual of phosphorus, which there are limits in the, in, the, uh, in the United States where plants have to achieve that level, that's the red line. You can see that if we want to be sure of getting all of the phosphorus out to that level, we may have to add as much as 16 times as much aluminum as there is phosphorus. This can produce a large amount of solids settling in your clarifier and, uh, or being filtered out that have to be dealt with. You combine that with the metal hydroxides that come from combining with the hardness and solids removal becomes a big part of a chemical phosphorus removal uh, system. So the equipment that's required to do it is obviously you need some kind of chemical storage, feed, and metering system to feed the metal ion into your uh, process. 
If you want levels below one milligram per liter, you're going to have to add a filtration step at the back end of your treatment plant. And it probably doesn't have one if you don't have a phosphorus limit or you're not, uh, and you're not treating to a reuse type of a standard. Uh, and that's obviously capital equipment cost. And, uh, and so most plants, if they can, use biological phosphorus removal. And we'll talk about the advantages in comparison here in a few moments. Biological phosphorus removal is accomplished by, again, microorganisms. And uh, these particular microorganisms can use phosphorus compound called ATP, uh, adenine triphosphate, as an energy source. We call these PAOs, phosphorus accumulating organisms. And these organisms will release the phosphorus from this ATP in their cells when they hit a, an environment that is called anaerobic, which means there is no dissolved oxygen and there is no nitrate. So there is no other, there's no oxygen source at all, essentially. Um, when we put those same organisms into an aerobic environment, they absorb phosphorus into their cells. And we use this by repeatedly cycling these organisms through those two zones, an anaerobic and an aerobic zone, and they will actually absorb excess phosphorus. And we then remove the phosphorus from the system by wasting those solids out, removing those bacteria out of the system. And uh, it's very effective. But it's only possible in an activated sludge process. We can't do this in any kind of a fixed film process because we have to actually physically remove the organisms from the system. And you can't do that if they're growing on a fixed media someplace. Um, if you remember from nitrogen removal, we talked about the MLE process, um, where we remove nitrogen. Well, with a simple modification, we can also remove phosphorus. We add a zone at the front of the, uh, of the treatment process that is anaerobic. Uh, and of course, we keep it mixed, but we add no air. And the phosphate uh, that is released by the microorganisms moves on into the uh, anoxic zone along with the BOD. Uh, we produce ammonia, obviously, some. The phosphate is not removed in the anoxic zone. It moves on to the aerobic zone along with our BOD and our ammonia. The aerated process then uh, breaks down the BOD removes the ammonia, and the phosphorus accumulating organisms will absorb the phosphorus in that aerobic environment. Now once again, we recycle back to the anoxic zone, uh, and we have our return activated sludge, you'll notice, coming into our anaerobic stage at the beginning. That's how the microorganisms get back into that stage. Um, so again, we, this is just the MLE process with a anaerobic zone on the front end. Now this process can, uh, as I stated earlier, can reduce nitrogen to about 6 to 10, 5 to 10 milligrams per liter, and it will reduce total phosphorus down to about 1 milligram per liter or less. So if a plant has a limit that is 1 milligram per liter, they can reliably remove the phosphorus biologically. They don't have to buy any chemical. They don't have to get rid of chemical sludge. Uh, we can also do this in the Bardenfo process. Um, in fact, the FO in Bardenfo actually stands for phosphorus. And so it was originally designed as a five-stage system with the phosphorus removal stage, the anaerobic stage, up front. Uh, I'll just quickly page through this animation. Um, it looks about like the last one, only with the two stages on the end for additional nitrogen removal. And the reason I show this is because um, this particular process is, uh, is state-of-the-art for nitrogen removal and phosphorus removal when you have the anaerobic zone on the front end. But you have five stages. Anaerobic, which remember means no dissolved oxygen and no nitrate. Anoxic, which means no dissolved oxygen, but we do have nitrate. Aerobic, anoxic, aerobic. 
This stage, or this type of a system, I mean, can reduce our total nitrogen to three milligrams per liter, or sometimes even less, and total phosphorus, again, about one milligram per liter, sometimes as low as 0.5 milligrams per liter, uh, fairly reliably, but typically we won't design uh, for less than one milligram per liter of removal because it's difficult to achieve biologically. So, in general, phosphorus removal, we have to ask ourselves, do I use chemical or I do, do I use biological removal? Um, biological removal, best case, again, is about 0.5 milligrams per liter. Reliably, we designed for about one milligram per liter. Chemically, however, we can go much lower. We can get as low as 0.01 milligrams per liter. Uh, reliably, about 0.05 milligrams per liter. So, uh, you also need to consider the capital costs involved, biological removal, you need some additional tankage, mixers, and so on. Um, chemical removal, you're going to have yearly chemical cost, you're going to have the chemical feed system, and you're going to, to uh, have to deal with the sludge that's produced. If your plant has a total nitrogen limit, then you're probably going to remove that nitrogen biologically, and you're going to have the tankage and infrastructure in place. It's very simple to add a small anaerobic zone on the front end of the system and use biological pea removal. Um, it's just one extra zone. That would make a great deal of sense. If your phosphorus limit, however, is less than one milligram per liter, you're going to have to do chemical phosphorus removal, and you will need final filtration after that. Um, if you have a total nitrogen limit and a very low phosphorus limit, it still makes sense to remove as much phosphorus biologically as you can because then you'll need much less chemical in the chemical step. So plants that have uh, low limits of both nitrogen and phosphorus always design for a biological phosphorus and nitrogen re removal and then add uh, a chemical step on the, at the end and they don't have to use nearly the amount of chemical that a plant does who doesn't do biological phosphorus removal. Let's summarize nutrient removal processes in general. Um, why do we want to remove these nutrients? Ammonia uh, exerts an oxygen demand on the receiving waters. We don't want low oxygen in receiving waters because that means plants and animals will die. Ammonia is toxic directly to many fish. Uh, nitrogen and phosphate act as fertilizers which promote algae growth, which can lead to the kind of eutrophication that I showed in the picture of the guy out in the, the algae pond. Um, we talked about nitrogen removal. There are some chemical methods available for nitrogen removal, removal but they're seldom used, um, particularly not in wastewater. Uh, so biological removal is the main nitrogen removal method that's used, and there are three stages depending on the type of nitrogen you need to remove from your plant. Uh, the main BOD removal stage of the treatment plant will convert organic nitrogen to ammonia. Uh, nitrification is the process of converting that ammonia into nitrate, and that's an aerobic process as well. And finally, denitrification is converting the nitrate into nitrogen gas, and that requires an anoxic zone. For phosphorus removal, um, we can use biological phosphorus removal for down to about one milligram per liter. Uh, best case, maybe half a milligram per liter. If we want to go lower, we need to use chemical. And uh, uh, if you don't have nitrogen removal, you probably want to do all your phosphorus removal chemically. If you do have nitrogen removal, then you can simply add one treatment zone and remove the majority of your phosphorus biologically and then uh, add chemical for polishing. Thank you very much.